So as I was said, I'm going to talk about some naturalistic behaviors in housing for um, laboratory rodents. It's not specifically on social housing, um, but as Jamie said this morning, often when you give them more space and more natural behaviors, you will see more of that social behavior come in as well. So the plan for the talk, I'm just going to start with some quick background. I'm then going to talk about permanent housing for rats, then this more novel idea of playpens for rats, and then I'm going to finish with some housing for mice. So for the background, I just want to start with a little bit of a historical perspective. Um, we started using, or we, humans started using rats in the early 1900s. At that point, nobody had colonies yet. So we had been using them a little bit, but nobody really knew how to house them. We didn't know anything about them. And so the Wistar Institute of Biology and Anatomy in Philadelphia was the first one to try to house these colonies of rats. And since they had no idea what they were doing, they decided to do research into what that would involve and what do rats need. And they published the results in this little book that you can find online. It was published in 1923. And what they described in there is that what they try to do is they strived to uncover the means of making rats contented and happy through an intimate acquaintance with the habits of this little animal. And they conclude some of the things that they found was that fear and lack of exercise are factors which react unfavorably upon the growing rat. So to address these, the cage that they developed um, was What's illustrated here, it had two compartments with a circular opening between the two compartments. Um, they said the reason to have the segregation of space is to allow rats to maybe nest in one space and um, be active in the other space. And they said it also allowed rats to cross from one space to the other if they became startled. And they said that the simple shifting in location appeared to satisfy the animal that it has protected itself. The rats are also provided with wood wool for burrowing in the cages. And finally, to address this lack of exercise, each cage also had another opening in the back and they communicated with a large running wheel um, that back in the 1900s was built around a bicycle wheel. And that's what the units looked like. And they housed up to 10 rats in each of them. However, accident of history maybe, um, a lot of people were developing independently simpler models that were just based more on convenience and cost effectiveness. Um, so this is some these are some examples of what people have come up with. Um, 1920, 1923, 1929. What I want you to pay attention to is the shape and the size of these cages. This is pretty much exactly what we're using today. Um, the only major feature that has changed is the material. They used to use wood, then metal, and now we use um, plastic. So as you see, the design of cages that we use today has changed very little since the early 1900s. Um, and the dimensions that we use today are really more based on tradition rather than any scientific evidence of what the rats um, and mice need. So how can we better meet the needs of rodents. So this is kind of my research area. This is what I've been working on. Um, I'll give you the results of one study um, that I did for my PhD. This is a video of standard housed rats. Um, this is filmed during the dark period when they're awake and they're active. Um, and as you see, they don't do anything. And I think most researchers and techs who work with rats have come to accept that this is what rats are like, um, that they're sedentary. I've heard people describe them as lazy. They don't really do much. But I had conflicting evidence. I heard that that's not really what rats are like. And one of the resources is this cool video that was made um, in Oxford by Manuel Bordeaux. You can now watch it online on YouTube, where he took um, Sprague Dolly rats and Long Evans rats, uh, bred in laboratories for generations, and released them into this large outdoor enclosure. And what you see in the video is that within hours, the rats started burrowing, they were living in their burrows, hoarding food in there, they were climbing. So clearly, all these behaviors have not been bred out. The rats have full capacity to, to engage in them as soon as they have the opportunity. So I decided to compare this standard housing with more naturalistic housing that would allow rats to perform some of these behaviors that we know they do consistently in the wild. Um, so the, this is what I used was a popular pet rat cage um, that allowed climbing and also contained soil in the bottom that would allow rats to burrow. 
and I obtained newly weaned spag dolly female rats, and then I randomly assigned them to housing. So they were randomly put in the standard housing or the semi-naturalistic. And this is just a really quick video to show you the difference um, in what these animals became. Um, this was from the same day and the same time as the previous video. Again, like I said, same group of rats, some were randomly put in standard, some were put in the enriched. They're not lazy, they're not sedentary, they do a lot, they're constantly active. So then I went about for this study just to quantify these behaviors. And what I focused on, sorry, just to back up, I, these rats were filmed with infrared cameras 24 hours a day for over a year. Um, so then I looked at those videos and I focused on three behaviors that the rats seemed to perform quite frequently and yet these behaviors weren't possible in the standard cage. Those behaviors were burrowing, climbing, and upright standing. And what I mean by upright standing is not just the rear where the back is still bent. Um, I meant full extended back legs, full straight back. Um, and of course, standard house rats cannot do this behavior because standard cages are about seven to eight inches high, whereas rats stand at about 10 to 12 when they're fully grown. And I scored all these behaviors at when the rats were three, eight, and 13 months old to capture some developmental differences or changes over time. So here's just the first clip of burrowing. Um, in this case, we were lucky. I don't know if you can see very well. Well, but all the black is soil and there's a tunnel in the front um, behind the plexiglass wall, so that's what we can see. So in terms of burrowing frequency, on the x-axis you have the age of the rats at 3, 8, and 13 months old, and this is the frequency per rat per day. Um, what we found is that rats burrowed approximately 30 times per day, and this is not using the burrow. I mean, they were in the burrows the entire light period, but this is active digging and coming in and out and building the burrows. They did that about 30 times per day each, um, and what we found is that this behavior was stable across um, the, the year that we looked at them. The fact that this rate was constant suggests that this burrowing behavior, this engaging in building the burrows, is something that is very important to the rats. And I say this because mammals, including humans, become less active as we age. So as kids, we're kind of bouncing off the walls, we're outside, we're playing, whereas as adults, we like to sit down, watch a movie, have a dinner party. We just were less active, and same goes for all other mammals. So what we do is we trade less important behaviors for rest, whereas the important ones we keep on doing as we grow. We also found some evidence that I want to look into more with future studies that this burrowing, the act of building that burrow, um, is, leads to positive welfare or positive affective state. And I'm saying this, first of all, the demeanor of the bats as they were digging, they were bounding in and out. Sometimes they'd be on the upper side of the cage and then just like bound up, run down and start doing the digging and going in and out. Um, there was some play involved around that as well. And rats also always burrowed, even though they had burrows. So it's not like, it wasn't about the consequences of having the burrow, there were many in the cage, but they just kept doing new ones constantly. Don't know what happened here. Climbing. This is the second behavior we looked at. So the rats climbed um, on the cage wall, they climbed on the structures in there, in the cage as well. Um, so you have the same type of graph again, daily frequency of climbing um, bouts per rat per age. So what you see is they climbed about 80 times per day when they were three months old and then basically one or two times when they were 13 months old. So this behavior, less important, declined with age significantly. Um, we think part of the decline was due to physical ability. When they were 13 months old, often they'd actually just like slip down. They didn't have the right grip. They were also more overweight. But we know you lose muscle strength and dexterity as you age. Um, However, rats are not often kept until they're eight or 13 months old. So with most people working with these young rats, they do benefit from the ability to climb. And finally, standing upright. So this is 
In the middle cage, middle here, you can see one rat doing this. We call this an exploratory stand upright. As you see, she's sniffing, she's kind of checking out. She seems to be rearing or standing upright to explore um, or investigate the cage. What we found is there's another type of standing upright, which you're going to see right here, which is a stretch. So here you see the paw extends and there's a yawn, and you're going to see this again with her. A little paw and a yawn. So we found that they do this upright standing kind of for two reasons. One is to explore and the other one was to stretch. We found that this upright standing was by far the most common behavior of the ones we looked at. Uh, the rats stood upright about 180 times per day when they were young and still about 80 times per day at 13 months. Um, that equ <laughs> equates about every four minutes when they were young and still about every 10 minutes when they're 13 months old. So again, something that they seem to want to engage in a lot. So that led us to a follow-up question. Because standard house rats cannot stand upright, they cannot stretch upright, we hypothesize that they might be doing more lateral stretches um, to compensate for this inability to stretch upright. Because as we see, when the bigger space, they do both. They do the upright as well. So I went back and we looked at the frequency of lateral stretching in the older rats at 13 months old between the two systems. What we found is indeed standard housed rats stretched about eight times as much laterally as the semi-naturalistic housed rats. Um, that seems like a lot, lot more than the semi-naturalistic. So then I looked at the frequency of all stretching we saw in the semi-naturalistic. So including the lateral stretches that we just scored plus the upright stretches that we saw, and still the, the standard housed rats stretched about three to four times as, more, as much. So if you, basically this again led me to the, to the hypothesis that this, this inability to stretch upright doesn't alone seem to account for why the standard house rats are stretching so much. Um, and that something else seems to be going on there. And if you look at the literature, what the function of stretching is, yes, it's a perisomnolent behavior when you wake up, but it's also a corrective response to stiffness that is caused by immobility or positional stress. So the implication being that this low mobility in standard cages they don't really have much space to move may lead to stiffness and positional stress, which the rats are attempting to alleviate by stretching all the time. So the conclusion from this study was simply that standard housing for rats does prevent the performance of many um, natural behaviors, and there is evidence that the standard cages are cramped. We did a follow-up study I'm not going to show today, but that looked at the effective states between the rats and the two systems, and the standard housed rats were having more negative welfare signs of being more stressed or impoverished. Now I'm going to talk about this new study that I'm currently coding, so this is very preliminary. Um, this big housing is wonderful, but most people will come to me and say, that's not feasible. We can try to invest into it in the future. I'm not going to do that tomorrow. We don't have the space. We don't have the money. So what can you do now? Um, so what some people started doing is um, this idea of play pens, which is that your rats live in standard cages, but they have intermittent regular access to an enriched area. The first time I heard of this was from a woman that works for AstraZeneca in the UK. Um, what she did in her facility, they house rabbits. They had empty rabbit pens sitting there, so she decided to take those, furnish them with rat-friendly toys, and um, put rats in there. So this is what her setup looked like. These are all things you have in your facility, empty glove boxes, some huts, um, some crinkle paper. She had pair housed male rats that she would then put five groups at a time, so she'd have um, big groups of rats, no fighting, and they, they would stay in there for a few hours a day. The main question everybody asks now is, okay, this is cool, it looks fun, I want to do this, but if I want to do this, I'm going to need to have some data that it, so it improves welfare. Like, is it actually worth it? My PI is going to want to know. Um, so this is what we're trying to, to, to look at right now. Um, so for this study that is still ongoing, I am using UBC's training rats. Um, what that means is every researcher that comes to, to the university, UBC, um, has to go through this animal training program where you get a rat, you practice how to anesthetize it, how to watch, how to hold, all that stuff. So these rats are just sitting in their standard cages 
for up to two years, um, and they are used maybe once a month by students for an hour in a class. So I said, hey, can I get your ads and put them in playpens and see what happens? So for this, we took um, all these rats, half of them were randomly allocated to a playpen treatment and the other half to a control standard novel cage treatment. Um, the playpen I used was one of the cages I had used previously for the, for the semi-naturalistic housing. And for this study, the rats had access to the playpen for 50 minutes a day, four times per week for five weeks. And I had two um, versions of the playpens. One had burrowing soil at the bottom, and the other one had wood wool, as we had seen historically, is what they had used um, for burrowing for rats. And that was just kind of another study within a study, just to look at, is there something more practical than soil? Um, because it gets really messy. Um, so I just wanted to see how differently they would use these two substrates. So here's just a quick video of rats in the wood wool playpen. Um, videos are really physical and bad. But there's one rat who was climbing here. There is a water tray here that the rats also use. This one is now digging into the floor. There's different types of fabric and fleece, just different materials for them. You really can't see much. There is a rat bounding here, running up and down, but I'll just skip it because you can't see anything. Maybe a little bit. If you pay attention to her, <coughs> We're looking at different welfare outcomes for this treatment versus for these playpen versus control treatment groups. We're looking at welfare indicators before they're going into their treatment. So what we're looking at here is their anticipatory behavior. Um, so how excited do they get at the prospect or condition? They know this this means I'm going in. Um, so is one group more excited than the other? Um, what we found very preliminary results, can't do stats on it yet, the sample size is too small, but we're seeing um, that yes, the rats that are going into playpens are more excited, they, are more they have more behavioral activation, which is how you measure um, this sort of behavior, than the control rats. So it would seem that they are looking forward to this experience going into the playpen more than the rats going into the control. We're looking at indicators of welfare during um, the treatment, so while they're in the playpen versus the control. So things we're looking at is, are they using the space? Are they engaging with the environment, or do they not really care about it? We're also going to look at the behaviors that are associated with positive or negative welfare, such as play. Um, the results I have now um, are for engaging with the environment. So for that, we just did scan sampling every two minutes. This is a very crude analysis for now that I just did for this talk. Um, but we, what we found is in the playpens, they spend about 8% of the time on the top shelf, about 24% in the middle. And again, this is not corrected for surface area. This is just to show you where they're spending their time. Um, but 18% on the lower shelf and almost, almost half their time in the burrowing substrate and also 8% on the ramps. So as you can see, they're really using the entire space and they're moving between all the levels. Just as a comparison in the control cage, they'll spend about 45% of their time on the substrate, another 45% of the time sitting on top of the boxes and 10% of the time sitting inside one of the boxes. In terms of type of activity, um, this is where you can compare ambulatory activities are much uh, more frequent in the playpen than the control. Non-ambulatory activities are more frequent in the control, and they're both spending about similar times being inactive. But you get a lot more movement in the playpens. In terms of types of behaviors, um, playpens, playpen mats spend a lot of time walking, um, which you, they hardly do in the controls. The controls, in contrast, do a lot of rearing. So as you saw in the photo, they're pretty much sitting on the boxes and rearing, um, and rearing and sniffing. That's all they do, and these guys do more walking. And this not visible part is when they're in the substrate. So they're pretty much walking between the levels or they're in the substrate. And then finally, we're also looking at welfare indicators after the treatments, after they come back from the playpens and controls. Uh, again, we're going to look at um, some positive related and negative related behaviors in their home cages. Um, but what I'm going to show today is the stretching rates between the two groups. So we want to see whether this exercise in the playpen, for instance, decreases the amount of stretching. So does that alleviate some of that immobility stress? 
What we're finding so far is in the immediate two hours after returning from their treatments, um, the control rats do stretch a lot more than the playpen rats. So we're seeing there is some relief, some of, some of that mobility relief, some of that stiffness. Um, however, if you're looking a little, a few hours later, once now the dark period starts, um, the, the difference disappears. So that stiffness seems to be alleviated for about two hours, but then they go back to being um, cramped again. So a summary of these very preliminary results is that we're finding that rats do want to go into play pens. Um, it's fine, something that they seem to find rewarding. If they interact with the play pens where, when they're in there, they do use the entire space. Um, and that exercise in the play pen seems to provide some alleviation from stiffness, but only temporary. Finally, I will talk about a study on mouse ho mice housing, and I did that with Becca Franks, who's going to talk about fish tomorrow. She was a co-author. So this is a very different issue, but. If you look across the animal kingdom, animals have separate sites for soiling and for sleeping and resting. And you see examples that are documented in the literature among the bees, the crickets, aphids. You'll see even caterpillar larvae have this mechanism to expel their fecal pellets up to 40 body lengths away from where they are. Um, and you have, for example, leaf cutter ants that, have, that will also leave their um, feces. <laughs> In, in a pile outside of their burrow entrance, so they leave them here. And on top of that, they have specialized waste worker ants which will, who will then carry that feces even farther away from entrances. If you look among the birds, you have bird parents will always take away the fecal sacs of their young away from the nest. And a burrowing species, the puffin, also has a designated latrine area at the entrance to their burrow. We have this documented behavior in reptiles. You have the yakka skink and the thorny devil pictured here. We have documented this behavior among many mammals, including rodents. And then we get to mice. Um, in a standard cage, the way we house them, all activities must occur within this small, single open space. Um, but there is a little bit of anecdotal evidence that suggests that mice may also prefer to nest away from where they're going to the bathroom. Some of these examples of anecdotal evidence are um, some technicians uh, published reports where they tried to give enrichment to their mice. They put some bottles in there, and what they found is that the mice either used them for nesting or as a latrine. Um, another comfortable quarters for mice and research institutions published some um, result, wasn't results, he just observations that if you put some demarcated area in the cage, the mice will tend to go to the bathroom in there. So we wanted to test this more um, empirically, so this is where we're going. We, s we stipulated that this inability to perform a naturally motivated behavior, if mice are motivated to avoid um, being in contact with the sites of elimination, it can lead to some frustration, it can lead to anxiety, it, it can lead to aggression, um, and abnormal behaviors such as stereotypies or displacement behaviors. And in contrast, good welfare in mice would be associated with some of more affiliative behaviors, so, so allo grooming, resting or sleeping next to a partner, and more locomotion. So the aims of this study were to investigate how mice would use and set up space in a standard system versus a more complex system, and looking also at behavioral indicators of poor and good welfare in each of the systems. The housing systems we use are from animal care systems. Um, it's the Opti mice and the block party. The reason we use this system is they have their standard cages, but they also develop these tunnels called block party that allow you to connect up to 10 cages um, together. So what we did is use their standard system. Every cage is provided with food, water, and nesting material, bedding, and had three mice. And their complex system consisted of three of these cages. Um, in each system, one cage was red, one contained food and water. All the cages were provided with some nesting material, with bedding, and each cage contained three mice, which really just means there were nine, cage, nine mice in the system, um, so, but that density was the same. And we used female Swiss Webster mice. And then for 14 weeks at cage changing, we would note the location of urine spots we would note the location of the nest, nest quality. And so for coding, we, each, we divided each system into three locations. For the 
Standard one, we had the back of the cage, which was the most open space. We had the front right location that contained the food and the water, and the front left. And then for the complex system, you have the red cage, the neutral cage, and the food and water cage. So these are just examples of um, what these cages look like. We took photos also at cage changing of every cage from the top and the bottom, and then blind observers scored the general soiling level in each of the cages, and also bedding coverage. And I'll get back to what bedding coverage means in a second. We finally also recorded mouse behavior over um, 12 scan sampling sessions. For example, the ones the behaviors I'll focus on are affiliative behaviors, uh, which would be positive, um, abnormal behaviors, which we consider negative, and locomotion, which is also positive. As we know, the lack of movement in mice is considered to be abnormal. So what we found is that all mice in both systems did attempt to segregate their nesting and soiling areas. Um, what we found is that urine spots in the standard system were, were by the food and water 98% of the time, and the nest was never 0% of the time found in this area. Similarly, in the complex system, we found urine to be in the food and water cage 98% of the time. Um, we also found that soiling level was the highest in this food and water cage where the urine was. And we found that the nest was built in the red cage 67% of the time. So even though we had nesting material provided in all the cages, the mice usually built one nest and they built it in the red cage. This is just a graph to represent these results. What I want you to focus on, so you have the standard system here, complex system here, and these are the three locations within each system. What I want you to focus on is the column that says both, so that both urine and nest almost hardly ever happened. What usually you had is only urine in one area and then half and half. The other two areas were half and half, either also had urine or had a nest, but not both. The really cool thing we found on top of this segregation is that mice moved bedding out of the nesting cages and into the soiled cage. So what we had is the soiling cage that had the food and water was usually packed high with bedding by the end of the week, whereas the red cage where they usually had the nest was almost completely stripped of bedding. So what we found is this association statistically is like wherever you had better nests, you had less bedding, and whatever you had more soiling, you had more bedding. And this is the graph showing this. Again, this, the, these, the dots are different nest qualities. So what you find is if soiling is zero, so very clean cage, you also happen to have zero bedding in it and very good nest. Whereas if you had high soiling, you also had a lot of bedding in there and no nest. In terms of behavioral differences between the systems, we found that in the standard system, we saw a lot less locomotion, we saw fewer affiliative behaviors and more abnormal behaviors. Um, specifically, um, these changes happened right after cage changing, and it happened more strongly in the standard system. So here's one graph for what we found with affiliation. So this is affiliative behavior. How many days from cage change? So what we see here is day zero. So the, right after cage changing, we have this big disturbance where these affiliative behaviors suddenly stop. So there seems to be a disturbance in this normal pattern of behavior, and the mice start doing a lot less of these after this disturbance. We then find is somewhere around day four, midweek, there seems to be another ongoing disruption happening that it decreases these behaviors again, um, and we are hypothesizing that it could be due to waste buildup. Um, even in the complex system, yes, it, it's, their, their waste is in a separate cage, but they still have to go in there um, to eat, to defecate, to drink, and that cage gets very dirty at the end of the week. So in summary from this study, we found evidence that mice prefer to have separate nesting and soiling areas, um, and that a standard cage does not allow mice to do this. When they have the opportunity, they put a much larger distance between those two areas, and furthermore, they will attempt to dilute the smell or the, the elimination area even more by bringing in more bedding in there. Um, we also found that several welfare indicators were better in the system that allowed spatial segregation um, because this complex system was associated with more locomotion, more affiliative behaviors, and fewer abnormal behaviors. So as a general conclusion from what I've 
talked um, this, after, this morning, is that standard housing does prevent many natural behaviors that are seen to be quite motivated in these animals, um, despite these centuries of captive breeding, and that laboratory cage design should be, um, allow these behaviors. We should, we should accommodate those behavioral needs. Um, so with this, I thank you. I want to thank my co-authors on these studies, um, my supervisor, Dan Weary, Becca Franks, my funders, and of course, all the animals who participated. Thank you. <laughs>